Okay, so um, my name is Dr. Michael Chuck. I am the lecturer for uh, the course English Language and Popular Culture and Media Studies. And uh, today I want to uh, talk to you about uh, the topic of popular song lyrics versus poetry. Um, you know, when we think of popular song lyrics, right, you know, the songs that you hear uh, and the words that you hear on the radio, in t on TV, on uh, in films, um, you know, you often think of them as more of a commercial, more of a mass culture type of product and activity, right? Whereas in contrast, when you think of poetry, you think of, you know, the works of Shakespeare and Wordsworth, um, you know, uh, works that are more high culture, right? More intellectual, more smart, if you will. So today I want to explore, you know, in a way, this gap and this contrast. Why do we have uh, this type of difference in terms of popular song lyrics as being more about the masses, more about everyday life, ordinary activities, and why do we see poetry as something that is more elitist, more high culture, high class? Are there any overlaps between these two activities? Right? Can we understand them in a more uh, balanced way? So that's our objective today. Now, before we go into that, maybe we can start with a definition first. Um, so, what are popular song lyrics? According to Adam Bradley, he says, Lyrics, no matter how artfully conceived and constructed they may be, rarely matter much alone. They exist in relation to the voice that enchants them through rhythm, melody, and harmony in relation to the instruments that intensify their language or obscure it entirely, and in relation to the experience of pop songs when heard alone or in a crowd. So there's a few things that you can pick up from Adam Bradley here, right? First of all, he reminds us that popular song lyrics are not just about words, right? They're about the relationship between the voice and also the music, right, such as rhythm, melody, harmony, uh, as well as the instruments that produces uh, these sounds and music, right? So the first thing we have to understand when we think about popular song lyrics is they are not just about words. When we appreciate and we understand song lyrics, we are actually also understanding them in the context of other things like music, like performance, okay? And in the case of popular song lyrics, we want to understand why some songs and their words can intensify our experience and our emotions, right? Whether we are alone listening alone or when we're going to a concert and listening to the crowd. Okay, so there's a lot of things to appreciate when it comes to popular song lyrics. It's not only about the words, it's about things around the words as well, like music, like the crowd, like the atmosphere, etc. So here, as you can see in Adam Bradley's book, the title is The Poetry of Pop. So that is quite fascinating, and it, it echoes back to our uh, original uh, topic for this presentation, right, for this talk here, is can there be an overlap between pop music, popular song lyrics, and poetry, right? So let's have a look at this and an example here. So. An example of popular song lyrics could be Taylor Swift's You Belong, right? And 
So the question is, can you belong, can Taylor Swift song also be poetry? So before we do that, maybe we can think about what is poetry? Poetry is a combination of form, music qualities, and meaning. So when we think of poetry, right, it's not, we, we differentiate it from other types of creative writings or writings in general, right? For prose, like a novel or like a short story, it is longer versions, right? And there, there isn't much emphasis on rhyming, right? There's not so much of that musicality to it. Um, and it's long report, like I said, 200, word, 200 pages, 300 pages long. For poetry, it's probably one page and four or five stanzas, right? So there's a, a difference in terms of length and in terms of the, the techniques involved in how poetry is written and delivered. Right, so here are some examples. Examples of form. Um, alliteration. What is an alliteration for poetry? Alliteration means uh, at the beginning of a word. It's repeated again and again in different words. So example here, taken from uh, the Taylor Swift song. But she wears short skirts and I wear t-shirts, right? So the S sound, it comes up again and again, and in a way it creates this type of rhythm, right? That uh, that the lyrics show you here. Um, of course, rhythm is a very important aspect of music. Another aspect of form, of poetry, uh, imagery, what is this? Imagery, example, she's cheer captain and I'm on the bleachers. Right, bleachers refers to you know in this in a stadium, right, or in a sports ground. You have the benches where people sit down and watch the game, right? That's the bleachers. So here, uh, the imagery is she's cheer captain. That girl, that she, is a cheer captain, a cheerleading captain, right? Someone who is very popular, someone uh, who's very proactive, right? Who's very active. Uh, moves around a lot, it's very athletic. I'm on the bleachers, right? Someone very passive, very quiet, maybe even shy, and just sitting down on the stands, on the audience stands, on the bleachers, right? So immediately, when you read this line, it creates that type of image, right? Of someone who's popular, and someone that is very quiet and shy and lonely, right? So that is the type of imagery that's also used uh, that can be found in poetry as well as in pop song lyrics. Another one, point of view. What is this? So example, if you can see that I'm I'm the one who understands you, right? So here you have uh, two type of points of view. I'm the one, right? So the I, of course, is the first person I, right? So it's coming from the first person uh, delivering it. and when we use the first person, right, you think of something as something more direct and intimate, or very personal, right? And therefore, I'm the one who understands you. So here, if the I, let's say, is Taylor Swift, then Taylor Swift is directly expressing her thoughts to you, to the audience, or to whomever else, whoever that you is. Right? So the point of view is also very important when we consider uh, poetry, right? Who's who is speaking uh, matters how we understand the words, right? So, for example, if we understand I here is Taylor Swift, you know, so here someone who is uh, a young girl, right? Probably she's around like 17, 18 here, um, you know, looks very shy, right? So this is someone who is a young female girl and very shy communicating these very deep and personal thoughts to me, right? So the point of view is very important when we consider poetry and for lyrics as well. How about an example of musical qualities? So rhyming couplets, right? A, A, B, B, right? Rhyming couplets referring to how uh, a, a, a line, right? Uh, it shares the same sound, same ending. 
right? So for example here, uh, she wears short skirts, I wear t-shirts, right? I'm on the bleachers. And then later on, the chorus or the bridge goes like, uh, find that you're looking for has been here the whole time, right? So in the You Belong With Me bridge part of the song, there's a run couple of A A B B, right? And of course, that's also uh, something you pay attention to when you're appreciating poetry as well. So if we think of poetry as a combination of form, musical qualities, and meaning, it seems to us that You Belong With Me, which is a very popular, very commercial song by Taylor Swift, already shares these two features. Uh, poetry, right? It has form, poetic forms, and it also has the musical qualities of poetry. What about the meaning? Though? What is the meaning of you belong with me for you? Right, so that's something I want to build on in the next slide because that is going to be very important for us to answer again this question. What is the difference between popular song lyrics and poetry? And why is there such a difference? So, we can, before we consider the meaning and also the, the difference between poetry and popular song lyrics, maybe we can look at a few more examples. Aside from Taylor Swift, right, who may be, you know, her, her songs may be poetry, Bob Dylan who is the singer-songwriter of Blowing in the Wind, right? a very popular and important anti-war song back in the 1960s. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize in Literature in 2016. So it's hard to argue that Bob Dylan is not uh, a poet if he won the Nobel Prize in Literature for his songs. Leonard Cohen, the singer-songwriter of the song Hallelujah, right? Is also a published poet. Hallelujah, you know, is a very uh, famous uh, popular song, you know, about religion, about faith, um, and you the, that has been uh, covered and performed again and again by many many popular song artists, right? Uh, it appeared on the Shrek movie, right? If I, if I remember correctly, um, it was also covered by West Side of the Lead as well, boy bands, right? So. Um, considering how popular the song Hallelujah is, Leonard Cohen, the author, the writer of the song, is also a published poet. So in a way, he also has uh, a poetic sensibility to it when he is writing his popular song letters. Here's a more even maybe extreme example. The Nobel laureate and Irish poet Stephen Steen described Eminem, the rapper, as a lyricist who created a sense of what is possible and sent a voltage around this generation. So, of course, you know Eminem uh, for many songs, Lose Yourself, uh, Without Me, um, Not Afraid, etc. Rap God. And he, of course, is someone, when we think of rap, we don't necessarily think of it as poetry, right? We think of it as more like just popular songs or even uh, very rebellious type of cultural activities. But for the Nobel laureate and the Irish poet Seen Heaney, he has very strong and high praise for Eminem's lyrics. So in a way, it, again, it begs us to think about the question, can popular song lyrics be literature and be poetry, right? From these examples, it seems to be yes. And if we go back to Taylor Swift, it also seems to be that Taylor Swift can be poetry as well, right? Can be literature, can be serious reading. So the question is, who decides what writings are literature and what, what writings are not literature? Who decides uh, Taylor Swift is not a poet, but simply a pop singer? Who decides this? So this is uh, a question that uh, is going to be very important when we think about, again, the difference between pop songs, pop lyrics, and poetry. So 
In order to answer this question, we can continue thinking about this through the concept of culture's ordinary. So let's look at this. Culture's ordinary is uh, coined by a critic. It's called Raymond Williams. And here's what he uh, elaborates about culture's ordinary. Culture's ordinary in every society and in every mind. So here, what Williams is trying to argue is that cultures from all walks of life are valuable, okay? So we're not talking about just uh, cultures of different nations, right? Like Japanese culture or French culture or uh, Nigerian culture. We're talking about cultures of different activities as well, right? Like popular culture, like pop songs, like Taylor Swift, or high culture, like uh, opera, like theater, like William, William Shakespeare, right? For Williams, all cultures from all walks of life are valuable. But here's the thing. He's not saying that popular culture can produce works that are valuable in high culture standards, right? What does, it mean, what does it mean? It means that when we are evaluating, for example, what Taylor Swift uh, is, uh, the value of Taylor Swift, we're not trying to think of her in terms of, let's say, a Shakespeare, like a Shakespearean sonnet. That's not the point. The point is, uh, there's no single standards for cultural value. Every work has their own merits on their own terms. Right? So this is really important here. Every work has its own value on their own terms. Own terms refers to uh, its own characteristics, its own features. For example, Taylor Swift, You Belong With Me, you know, is a popular song that is valuable not necessarily because of, let's say, uh, the imagery has a lot of history and cultural background to it, right? It could be valuable simply because it's simple and because it's very relatable to a 21st century audience, right? Or maybe a 21st century internet audience, right? So it's very uh, unfair in a way to appreciate Hillis Swift based on the standards of 16th, 17th century uh, Shakespearean uh, type of standards, yeah? So that's something very important. When Raymond Williams says, culture is ordinary and culture is valuable everywhere, he's not saying that uh, every culture uh, can meet a certain standard of excellent and value. Instead, he's saying that there's no single standards, okay? So then you may ask the question, okay, if there's no single standards of value, who creates those type of standards, right? Because if you want to measure the value of, let's say, Taylor Swift or Eminem or uh, even, you know, black and pink, right? Who sets the standards? So this is where we come to of the field and the subject of popular cultural studies, right, which is the subject that I teach here in uh, Open University. So what is popular cultural studies? We can first think of the definition first. What is popular culture? According to Marcel Danessi, he says that popular culture is the culture that's obliterated the distinction between high and low forms, allowing people themselves to evaluate artistic products and expressions. Right? So here the Nessi defines right, that for public culture, it has no distinction between high and low. So if we go back to uh, poetry and popular song lyrics, right, there is no distinction between popular, popular song lyrics as low, low culture or commercial, and poetry as something high, something elite, to something very smart. For public culture studies, there's none of that, right? Instead, this allowing people themselves to evaluate artistic products and expressions. People is referring to 
you, referring to me, referring to everyone. Everyone has their own way of uh, evaluating what is valuable or not. Right? So that's basically what we do and what we try to explore for this course uh, on a course on public culture studies. We try to think about why something is valuable, and we try to explain it, right? So, for example, popular culture uh, can be expressive and eclectic. So, we think about why a popular culture product or a culture culture activity can be expressive. Why does it challenge, or how does it challenge moral aesthetic norms, right? Standards, in other words, how does it challenge our common standards? How does it show there's no difference between high and low, right? How does it, in a way, uh, uh, appeal, right? Attract, relate to people from all walks of life, right? From your 10 year old cousin to your 45 year old secondary school teacher, right? How do they all appreciate, in a way, a culture product, right? Uh, and most importantly, they're driven by you, right? So public culture studies is something that is, uh, in a way, very ambitious. It doesn't have a lot of rules to it, right? Just like how youth, right? Uh, young people, uh, they don't necessarily consider or have too much hesitation about uh, expectations and norms, etc. So that is in a way uh, what we try to highlight for public culture studies. So to wrap up, public culture studies or uh, the study of, let's say, public song lyrics versus poetry is really about thinking how you decide and explain uh, the value of popular song lyrics, right? At the same time, you determine how you uh, value and understand and appreciate poetry, right? You are the one who are to decide uh, these standards, right? And through that, we learn more about not only the world, our society, but also about ourselves. So that's really what we are trying to do for uh, the course English Language Media and Public Culture Studies at Open University. Thank you, uh, and I hope to see you uh, at Open University.